So in this briefing, we're going to talk about an ongoing crime that's happening right now in the HIV space, but is likely to grow beyond that. What's unique about these counterfeits are they're actually passing through the legitimate supply chain, in particular licensed bricks and mortar pharmacies. That's unusual. So we'll describe the crime from the patient's point of view and then talk to two people who've been involved in both public service work to educate patients and then also to chase the counterfeiters down. Brandon McSatta is a long-term HIV survivor. He serves as the CEO of the ADAP Advocacy Association, which is a national nonprofit dedicated to increasing access to care and treatment for people living with HIV. He's also a proud papa and an avid Boston Red Sox fan. Jeffrey Potter is a partner at Patterson Belknap and has been representing pharmaceutical companies and other corporations in any counterfeiting matters for more than 20 years. He's hunted down and shut down counterfeiters globally who've endangered patients with fake medical devices and fake pharmaceuticals. Virtually all the counterfeit products he stopped have the potential to cause serious injury or death. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for including me. So Jeffrey, let's start with you. Describe this crime if you don't have to, if you, have, if you haven't been following it in the papers, what exactly has been happening here? What we have happening here, unfortunately, is just a very large version of a crime that's been going on for a very long time. We have uh, large organized gangs that purchase medication from low-income people, people um, experiencing homelessness, people who are addicted to narcotics. They get their medication either from Medicaid or Medicare for free, or they get it from uh, pharmaceuticals, patients assistance programs, for free. And they have this medication because they need it to treat their condition. And here it's almost always people um, who are HIV positive and need uh, their critical antiviral medicines in order to, to keep uh, their condition in check and also so that they will, won't be contagious and spread the infection to other people. And so they're prescribed this medication. And instead of taking their treatment medications, the same sort of people that sell crack and other narcotics in the community are reaching out uh, uh, to these um, uh, uh, to these people and purchasing their medicines from them for a few dollars. And then what they're doing with the medicines is they're removing the, the prescription labels and they're putting them back into the supply chain. Mixed in with these medications, sometimes they get empty bottles and they take those bottles and they put different pills into the bottles. They put a fake seal on the bottles and then they sell them uh, to uh, um, licensed but uh, criminal distributors who then sell them to pharmacies um, at a few percentage points less than they could buy the authentic medicine coming from an authorized distributor. So what happens to the patient who is going to their trusted pharmacist and buying the medication, and often the pharmacist just doesn't know uh, or suspect this product in any way. By the time it gets to the pharmacist, the difference in price between a legitimate bottle coming through the proper supply chain and one of these bottles is very small. Uh, the pharmacist buys this medicine and then dispenses it to the patient. Patients typically don't look at their pills. Um, and what we were finding is uh, uh, very rarely would people discover that their bottle had been refilled with something else. If the patient opens it up and compares it on the internet to the pill that they're supposed to be taking, usually the differences are very big. In some schemes, we have people who buy pill presses and attempt to um, replicate the authentic pill. We haven't found that here. What we find is they'll put something like Excedrin in, or unfortunately, in many cases, they put in an antipsychotic medication in for reasons that, that we don't know other than it must have been available to them when they were refilling and re resealing the bottles. And this came to our attention because some patients looked at the medication and said, this, this doesn't look right. They'd go to their pharmacist and then it would get reported uh, uh, to the authorities. Um, 
in, in other times, unfortunately, the patients had a terrible side effect uh, from the counterfeit drugs in it. And uh, the hospital or, or their physician uh, looked at the medication and then reported it to, to the authorities. Uh, important to note here, the bottles are always authentic bottles with authentic lot dates and serial numbers on them. Uh, what's fake about the bottles is how they got through the distribution chain, that they went to a patient, were dispensed to the patient, and then came back. That's never permitted, of course, in the United States. Um, and what the criminals do is they circumvent uh, our system of protections and put it into the hands of the patient. The answer as to why people counterfeit medications uh, is, is very simple. It's, it's hugely profitable. To the counterfeiting uh, of a million dollars of baseball caps fills two trailer truckloads. You can put a million dollars of counterfeit medication in the trunk of your Lamborghini. It's small, easy to transport, and easy to sell and extraordinarily profitable because when the drugs are counterfeit, they cost either nothing or pennies. And they, of course, sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, Jeffrey, it's the case here that that it seems like there are people who who have financial struggles who are being offered a terrible choice of selling their medicine that they need to live or, or take it. But the individuals doing the buying here are the real criminals. Are we talking about just like one guy who's doing this in like Cincinnati or is this a much larger operation? Just how big is this? I would call them collectors. How big is this collector industry that's buying medicine from from patients? The size is in the billions of dollars each year just on HIV medication. Um, over an 18-month period, we have seen sales of more than $350 million. And we're measuring uh, uh, that not by some abstract number, but by the dollars spent by pharmacies to buy this bad medicine. Brandon, let's talk a little bit about your work in public education around this issue, the patient's role, as Jeffrey said, as the last line of defense. Tell me a little bit about, about what, what called you to action in this area. Well, first of all, Jeffrey, I want to say thank you for your commentary on, on this subject because it is important. And I, I think patients need to understand and something very important too is echoing your sentiment that we as patients are the last line of defense. And one of the biggest things I try to communicate to patients is to be more, more proactive as the patient uh, because your life is potentially in, in the balance. So first of all, when you get your prescription, is the bottle the same? Do they look the same? If they do, does the pill itself look the same? On the pill, is the marking the same? When you put it in your mouth, does it taste the same? There's, there's, these are simple steps but they are important steps. And, and you were saying earlier that with these, this particular counterfeit ring, the bottles look the same, okay? But there are still other steps you can do. And then certainly if you're feeling any sort of adverse reaction immediately, call your doctor, call your pharmacist and, and you know, get the medical advice and guidance that you need. But the reality is this is happening. Um, I, I don't think, I think we're gonna see more of it happening. And it, it's alarming to us um, in the HIV community to have so many high profile cases in such a short period of time. You had it impacting Johnson & Johnson, uh, Gilead Sciences, uh, and I think there's potential that we'll see even more of it. Brandon, you've stated it very clearly. And it's, it's something that patients shouldn't have to do, but it's something that I do with my own medicine. It's something that I've taught my children to do with their own medicine. And it's something you should do with all medicines because, you know, sometimes there are errors when, in good faith by pharmacists when they refill bottles. People had tended not to do it with factory sealed bottles because they trusted those bottles to be correct. But even those bottles, you need to check the medication 
And you need to also be thoughtful that if your medication isn't working, you need to think about your source of medication, whether you need to change the medication or whether you need to change where you're buying your medication as well. It's something to just have in mind when you speak with uh, your healthcare provider. Um, because unfortunately, that is a, that, that is a, 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 a risk that not all doctors have in mind when, when advising their patients. And it would be a fair thing for you to raise with the physician, particularly if you purchase medicine online, but unfortunately also if you purchase the medicine from your trusted community pharmacist. Jeffrey, I, the message I send to patients is to be as proactive as you are in other parts of your life. And if you think about, sometimes I think we take our own health for granted the safety around our healthcare system for granted. Why is it as a consumer, you can go to a restaurant, order a steak, order a hamburger and want the meat cooked a certain way. And if it comes out and you've ordered it medium rare and it's well done, what do you do? You say something, this isn't what I ordered and you send it back. But we as patients, when something doesn't taste right, look right, feel right, We just kind of acquiesce and say, oh, I I guess it's just me or something's going on. No, stop, take inventory of what's going on and do something to take care of your own health. Because again, you as the patient are the last line of defense. My family, half of my family is from Pakistan. And I remember the first time I had this conversation with a relative when I was was back in Pakistan. And my aunt said to me, you know, I was... I was taking this medication and it wasn't working. So me and the doctor had to figure out if it was counterfeit. And I remember thinking, you never have that conversation in the US because our secure supply chain is so good that it never occurs to either doctors or patients that the medicine may be counterfeit. We're in some ways the most easily defrauded patient population because we have come to rely and incorporate that trust in how we review our medical system so deeply that it doesn't even occur to us that there may be fraud. Jeffrey, you stated that you have seen documentation and you've you've handled documentation for antivirals that are counterfeit and diverted for $350 million worth. And that's just what you have receipts for, so to speak. Do you think that this crime is likely bigger than that? Does it go beyond antivirals? Yes. I I know for a fact that it involves lots of different medications because we see from the same patients that sold their antiviral medications sold other medications that they had been prescribed and we see other medications coming along with those pills the antiviral medication um is has been a target of these types of schemes for many years. Uh, There was just a criminal conviction by a jury of individuals that um, were apprehended more than a decade ago in a very large antiviral uh, uh, scheme that had been shut down by the government. The $350 million of antivirals I'm referring to was sold by a scheme over uh, uh, an 18 month period uh, during the pandemic. It continues now today. Well, we have stopped the people in this scheme. We know there are still people buying medications. There are many people who cooperate with us um, who are are low income or homeless people who, who report to the companies that people are coming to us to buy our medications. Uh, sometimes it said, um, oh, these people are paid for their medications, uh, so that's not a bad thing when they're selling it. But it is a bad thing. It's a bad thing for the patient because they suffer the debilitating effects of the viruses and the other conditions that they have. It can lead to death if you don't take your medicine for a long enough period of time. And it also affects the community as a whole because when people don't take their antiviral medicines, they become contagious. That's really uh, people who, who, many people don't understand how fabulous the new generation of antiviral medication is. 
when people take this medicine as it's prescribed, they're no longer contagious and can no longer spread the HIV virus. When you stop taking the medicine, the viral load explodes in the body and the patient becomes contagious, thus exposing the community at large to the spread of diseases that aren't curable. And so we don't want people selling their medicines. And we certainly don't want bad medicine going to patients who need these drugs to control their own condition and protect their families and loved ones. So it, it's, it's a very serious problem and um, one that is worth pausing and taking the steps that you can uh, uh, to protect yourself. Can I piggyback on what Jeffrey just said um, about the impact on patient as well as the community? Uh, we know today that a person living with HIV who takes uh, medication as prescribed daily and is adherent is expected to live a normal life expectancy well into their 80s. Uh, the terminology we like to use is U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable. It's undetectable is important to that patient because it means their, their body is healthy their immune system is stronger. But for the community perspective, I, as someone who's living with HIV and an undetectable viral load, means that I am not in a position to give my HIV to someone else. So I'm protecting my neighbor, I'm protecting myself, and I'm protecting my neighbor. And what's unfortunate with these, um, these criminals or these criminal rings that are doing this, these collectors that you like to call them, they're, they're putting the patient at risk and they're also putting the community at risk. And, and I think there's a reason why we have to be more vigilant in, in combating this sort of counterfeit ring. And honestly, as well, I, I, I'm always upset to see, you know, a, a program to supply medicine to people who would otherwise struggle financially to afford it, to fail at that last step. Right. You've gone to all the trouble to create a government program, to to execute it, to get that medicine for cheap or free into the hands, or maybe it's a company program of the patient, and then to have it not fulfill its promise, especially given the fact that we're all old enough to have lived through the AIDS crisis. We remember when these medicines didn't exist that are now life changing um, for someone not to have access to them uh, is just tragic, absolutely tragic. And and of course. When Medicaid and Medicare has paid for the medicines and instead of them being used by the recipients who so desperately need this medicine, instead it, the medicine, is, when it is sold, that's theft from the government. And while one bottle is not a large theft, when you multiply it by tens of thousands of bottles, most of that $350 million that went through this scheme was stolen from the government. That's fraud worth prosecuting. <laughs> so Jeffrey, you've seen a lot of the case material. You've interviewed a lot of people. Do you think that there were patients who actually took medicines that were probably just Excedrin <laughs> or Tylenol or placebo and had no idea that they were endangered, that they took that whole bottle and finished it and, and had no idea that they were no longer protected? We're certain that happened and, and happened many times. Um, you know, and um, many of the patients who did bring complaints brought the complaints um, when they were almost finished with the bottle. And uh, we, we know that um, we only have a small number of complaints because people don't do uh, the steps that Brandon um, so articulately described a little while ago um, to, to look at the medicines um, that, they, that they take. And, it, and it's something you should do, whether it is an antiviral uh, medicine or, or any other medicine. Just pause, take a look at the pills, taste the pills, um, make sure it's what you're expecting um, and what the internet tells you they should they should look like. A lot of this is obviously shrouded in, in mystery, Jeffrey, but you and your team have spent, at this point, it feels like years trying to work your way through the organizations, understand the different players, and, and you've probably learned a little bit finally about the ringleaders 
Um, tell me what you have learned about the people at the top of this, what, what I think will be a billion dollar plus scheme by the time it's done. The people who are at the top of it um, are unfortunately uh, like you would expect them to be if you watch uh, Netflix movies. They fly private jets, they drive Lamborghinis, they have Rolls Royces, Maybachs, Ferraris, and sometimes all four. Um, they have oceanfront homes. They go to casinos and think nothing of dropping five or six million dollars on a trip. Um, they are awash in money. They carry around cash in backpacks, in briefcases, and in some cases, shopping bags, because there's so much of it from this. They engage in very sophisticated money laundering. Um, and uh, they've been caught, but that doesn't mean that somebody else hasn't stepped in to take their place. Just because you've caught one bank robber doesn't mean banks don't need vaults and security guards anymore. Until our drug supply chain is made more secure, there are going to be other people exploiting it because the profits are so great. If you look at what these criminal um, ringmasters are doing and the people they're targeting. Um, HIV, we largely know, in, disproportionately impacts communities of color, women, um, people from social, lower social economic status. The people that are being targeted by these schemes are the people who need the help the most. It is, it's immoral what they're doing. And I think we as patients would like to see more of our government enforcing, um, making it better for these drug supplies to be safer, uh, to enforcing whatever laws they can use to put these criminals behind bars, um, because these are people's lives that we're dealing with, and the populations that they're targeting are already in many ways um, underserved and don't need one more thing putting their own health at risk. So, Brandon... As a, as a patient and a survivor, do you remember the first time you heard about this crime? What went through your head at the moment at which you first learned that there were people adulterating HIV medicines in the supply? As a young kid, do you remember Yogi Berra saying for the first time, it's deja vu all over again? <laughs> um, you know, it seemed like we just got over the, the counterfeit, the Johnson & Johnson counterfeits getting into the drug supply chain, and it was the first major... HIV antiviral news story in this space in, in a long, long time. And I think it, it, it shocked us all. And we no sooner get over some of that shock and some time goes by and we start to feel safe again. Um, and then this happens. And then the scale of it and finding out that um, some of these medications, counterfeit medications, did make it into the hands of patients. Uh, it was alarming. And, you know, just as we had done previously with Johnson & Johnson, our organization had stepped up to collaborate with Gilead to get the word out to the street, to the grassroots, to let them know, hey, this is going on. Um, you need to be in touch with your community organizations, your aid service organizations, your pharmacists, your case managers, whoever uh, is your support network to make sure that this is potentially not impacting you. A lot of PSM's membership is... Uh, pharmacies and state pharmacy associations, I should say, state ph representing pharmacies. Um, you have been involved in, in Lanham Act uh, prosecutions against a number of players in this ring, but a couple of them include pharmacies. And so I'm sure that it, at first blanche, a pharmacy would say, well, I bought this medicine from a licensed state board of pharmacy licensed wholesaler. You know, if it was counterfeit, I don't know what I really could have done and, you know, what's my exposure. So I'm going to turn that to you. You know, there are certainly some pharmacies who probably did not look hard enough at too, a too good to be true price when they bought this product and just enjoyed the profits. What is the exposure legally and financially for a pharmacy that chooses to traffic in medicine that is got a price that's too good to be true and endangers their patient population. Well, let's let's talk both about the, the civil and criminal exposure. Let's take the case of a pharmacist 
who really did not know, in fact, did not even suspect that the products that they purchased were counterfeit. On a, the civil side, it is a, what is known as a strict liability offense. In other words, even if you did so unknowingly, merely because you sold a counterfeit product, you are liable to the manufacturer for the wholesale value of the products that you sold. Um, and if you sold very expensive medication, uh, it, those damages can very quickly uh, uh, add up. Uh, there are pharmacists who dealt in, in, in hundreds of thousands, in some case millions of dollars of counterfeit medication and uh, have been sued. What the manufacturers have been doing is trying to deter pharmacists from these bad acts. And so they have selected a few pharmacists to sue in order to educate other pharmacists of the risk. And those were pharmacists that they chose to sue who received warning letters telling them to not buy from the secondary market in fact, in cases do not buy from specific distributors that were selling counterfeits. And they ignored those warning letters and then went out and bought large quantities of pharmaceuticals. So they've been sued. Now, if they had bought from a legitimate distributor, they, of course, could then go sue their distributor or demand that their distributor defend them and make them whole. But because they bought from licensed criminals, they don't have that option because they can't and won't stand behind them. So how do you avoid, how does a pharmacist avoid this problem? You avoid this problem by buying only from authorized distributors because authorized distributors only buy from the manufacturer. So there is, by definition, no risk of having counterfeit. If the medicine is less expensive than the wholesale price that the manufacturer sells it for, that means there has been wrongdoing somewhere on the distribution chain. And you as a pharmacist should stay away from those products. Pharmaceuticals, patented pharmaceuticals are only sold at one price. There are no legitimate deals that can be had on these products. And so you should protect your patients by buying from authorized distributors. Uh, to the other possible liability is criminal liability. Uh, there are very few strict liability criminal statutes, very few of them. Uh, one of them is the sale of a misbranded pharmaceutical. A counterfeit is a misbranded pharmaceutical. And you can be put in prison just because you sold it, because you did not take the appropriate steps. Uh, two years ago, I was involved in a case where um, a woman had sold uh, a, a small dollar value of counterfeit surgical devices one sale, one purchase, and she was prosecuted for having done so, from having uh, sold uh, these medical devices. The dollar amount was in the single thousands of dollars. Uh, again, a very, very relatively small transaction. And uh, she was sentenced to, to a year in prison and uh, served its federal time and, and spent during COVID a year in prison. Um, these are real risks. Uh, and there are real risks to the patient and real risks to the pharmacist and easily avoidable by just purchasing from authorized distributors. Gentlemen, thank you. This has been really enlightening. This crime, I feel like, will be a crime that I will talk about for years. We, we've studied a number of previous enormous crimes, some of which made into best-selling books. Uh, and we'll be talking about this crime for a long time. I hope that 
that Brandon, in your work, you continue to raise patients' awareness about the dangers and that we can work beyond just the HIV space because this is clearly a problem that's bigger than just you know, HIV medicines. And Jeffrey, for your work, thank you. I hope you have all the best of luck both finding these individuals and unmasking them and making sure that you take everything you can from them in, in the courts and in litigation. Thank you both and stay tuned for the next one. Have a good day, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Thank you.